Good evening, everybody. Going to give a, a little bit of time here for people to get into the room and then we'll get started. Thank you so much for, for attending this evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm Rich Hoyt. I'm co-chair of the Animal and Biotechnology Department here at Delvel, and I have the honor of also being the chair of the One Health Working Group, who is bringing this event to you this evening. For those of you who have been on before, you have heard my description of One Health probably many times. Uh, but for those who have not attended before, let me just give you kind of a rundown on what One Health is and why you should not only know what One Health is, but kind of keep it within your mind for your discipline and for your careers ahead or, or whatever your life may bring to you. So as the description at the bottom says, One Health is a transdisciplinary systems approach. Well, let's put it in another way. Uh, we've got one planet. Uh, we live on that planet all together, but not just by ourselves, we also live within an environment and we share this world with uh, plants and animals of many, many kinds. And we are dependent on each of those elements as much as those elements are dependent upon us. Uh, our activities certainly have impacts upon them and the things that impact them also come back and have an impact on us as well. So at Del Val, about nine years ago now, uh, we have adopted this, this concept of One Health and brought these seminars uh, to our audiences to try to demonstrate that essentially, and what I tell to my students, everything is about One Health. Um, at Delvel, we approach this in a couple of different ways. Uh, education. So for those uh, who are our first year students at Delvel, they're hearing about this within the Delvel experience too. And they may be also hearing about it within the first year experience too, encouraging people to get involved with activities on campus. Uh, we're also engaged in many, many different courses, uh, certainly within my area of conservation and wildlife management and zoo science. Um, One Health is something to live by. But even if you're a business major, or especially if you're a business major, the One Health concept is something that you should understand. It's important to listen to other disciplines, discuss problems with many different people because there are gonna be better issues or better solutions to those problems coming from a transdisciplinary approach than from just one approach alone. And it took me a long time in my career to learn that, but I hope that you can learn this earlier. I think that it will certainly benefit your careers. We also encourage uh, research and at Delvel we have true student research. So we would really encourage students to be looking at uh, types of activities that would involve multiple departments. And then finally outreach. And that's what this evening is all about is outreach. Uh, through our uh, One Health seminars, we offer six of those each semester. And we, uh, have these also posted at delval.edu forward slash one health, one word, past in this seminar as well. Uh, the recordings will be posted there for, for you to see even after tonight. Tonight, we are extremely lucky to have a speaker that I've heard before, and I'm so glad to listen to him again, Matt Simon. And so Matt Simon, uh, is a senior staff writer at Grist Magazine, where he covers climate solutions. He's the author of three books, most recently, this book right here, A Poison, A Poison Like No Other, which you're gonna be hearing about tonight. Uh, I will also be placing uh, the link into the chat for you to be able to go and purchase this book. And so certainly encourage you to do so in Island Press, who, so graciously helped arrange this to this evening are also offering a discount um, with the code webinar all in caps 
So uh, Matt lives in San Francisco, a place that I've spent a little bit of time in, love, and I'd love to get back to this evening. Thank you so much, Matt, for joining us, and I turn it over to you. Thank you so for, so much for having me. It's uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, wish we could be meeting under better circumstances that aren't about uh, microplastics polluting the entire planet and our bodies. Uh, but we're going to keep this as lighthearted as we possibly can. I promise. Um, I'm going to share my screen here to show you some slides. Uh, here we go. I hope you can all see this because I'm just going to keep talking. Um, yeah, microplastics and nanoplastics. Uh, I wanted to start by talking about some definitional stuff here. So when we're talking about macroplastic that we all know of, that includes the bottles and bags, that's the big stuff. Uh, a piece of plastic becomes a microplastic when it gets smaller than five millimeters. It's about the size of a pencil eraser, I guess the width of a pencil eraser. Um, but these things get even smaller. So as these microplastics are floating around the oceans and flying through the skies, they are breaking into smaller and smaller pieces. Uh, we now have something called nanoplastics, which are little bits of plastic smaller than one millionth of a meter. So these are small enough to actually get inside individual cells, uh, both within the human body and in animals all over the planet given that this stuff is absolutely everywhere scientists have been looking. Uh, so when we're thinking about these pieces of plastic that are flying around, uh, they are a cohesive material, right? It's a chunk that can interact with things in the environment. Um, but within that material are lots and lots of chemicals. Uh, I need to update this slide. This study has actually been updated. So they found at least 10,500 different chemicals have been used in plastics. Doesn't necessarily mean that a single piece of plastic has 10,000, 5,000 chemicals. Um, just over the lifetime of, of plastics production, 10,500 have been used. This has recently been updated to over 13,000 different chemicals. So a lot of these are chemicals that we know for sure to be toxic to humans or otherwise life on this planet, uh, like cadmium and lead. Um, Lead is used for coloring for some reason, a lot of these plastics. Uh, so when these things are floating around the environment, of course, something that is small in the ocean, like plankton, these little tiny creatures that are floating around out there can swallow these little bits and they can get stuck in their digestive system. But even if it doesn't get stuck in there, when it's moving through that creature, it's releasing these chemicals. Um, these are known as, known as leachates. Um, and even within just the ocean itself, because there are so many microplastics and nanoplastics out there, they are constantly releasing these leachate chemicals, which is then dosing all the creatures around them um, with those, a, a lot of chemicals that we know to be fully problematic to life on this planet. Uh, I want to be very clear that plastics are really just solid fossil fuels. Um, over 99% of plastics are still made out of oil and gas, uh, the byproducts of those extractions. Uh, when we're talking about the increasing production of plastic, um, exponential increase, I should say, over the coming decades, we're going to be getting up here to the equivalent of hundreds of coal-fired power plants just in the production of plastic and the way that it actually breaks down in the environment and releases that carbon as greenhouse gas as it's out there. Um, so don't let anybody tell you that um, plastics are sustainable. Um, they are not, they never will be, even if they're bioplastics, which is something that we can, we can get to later. They come with their own problems. Uh, some sources, uh, we all know about the microbead saga in the United States. They were banned some years back. These are little pieces of plastic that were added to Products to exfoliate uh, turned out to be an extremely bad idea. Um, you can do the same thing with natural materials like apricot pits, yet it was cheaper for these companies to use little bits of plastic instead. Um, microfibers, you've probably heard of. Uh, some two thirds of clothing now is made out of plastic. So things like polyester, uh, spandex, uh, these are plastics, very soft plastics, but plastics Nonetheless, uh, when you do a load of laundry, I'm not blaming you for this, but when you do that, millions of these fibers break off in the wash and then flush out to a wastewater treatment facility 
uh, and it either flushes out to sea or gets put onto land. We'll get to that again later. Um, either way, there's nothing stopping for a single load of laundry to wash millions of fibers into the environment. Think about how much laundry you do a year and then scale that up to how many people there are in the United States. A sneaky source of microplastics is actually car tires. So tires are no longer made out of pure rubber. Uh, we just don't have enough rubber trees on the planet to do so. Uh, so they are made out of plastic, uh, synthetic rubber instead. I didn't think about this until I was writing the book for some reason, um, but like what happens when you wear down the tires on your car, you have to go get them replaced every once in a while. Where has that tire gone? Well, it has broken into little pieces like this and then flushes into gutters and then untreated flushes into uh, bodies of water in the environment. Um, these are interesting little pieces because they can actually accumulate different pollutants because they're kind of squishy and sticky. Um, so as they're tumbling around the roads, they're picking up things like oil, um, little bits of brake pads, all sorts of things before they then flush into the environment. Paint is another very sneaky source of microplastics. So um, as you see here, lots of different things in the marine environment need to be painted to make sure that they don't fall apart immediately. Uh, boats, bridges. I'm in San Francisco, as was mentioned, where we have the Golden Gate Bridge that is famously repainted quite often just because of the weather here. Uh, breaks apart that paint. Uh, where does it go? Well, it either takes to the air or it drops directly down into San Francisco Bay. Um, this is such a harsh environment, especially for ships, that they are constantly repainted because this stuff is just wearing off. Uh, there was a study a few years ago that actually found, uh, they called them ship tracks. So they were basically tracks of microplastics that these ships leave in these busier parts of European ports. Um, it's like a skid mark from a tire, only this is made out of little bits of paint, uh, and it, which is, of course, very not good for these marine environments. Yet another one here, uh, we are throwing a lot of plastic into the environment by way of filters for cigarettes. These are made out of microfibers, um, different from what's in your clothes, but, but same principle. Uh, we throw away trillions of these things a year uh, directly into the environment. When smokers step on them to put them out, that essentially primes them to better break apart. And then that releases those microfibers over the, the course of the lifetime of that, um, that cigarette butt. And interestingly enough, consistently, the number one thing that people are finding on beach cleanup walks are not bottles and bags, but cigarette butts. This is a huge source of plastic into the environment because we have this mentality that you can just finish your cigarette and chuck the things into the environment and be done with it. People thinking maybe that it's an organic thing because it's tobacco, but tobacco itself is, of course, an amalgamation of all kinds of different chemicals we don't want in the environment either. And of course, when you smoke, as you can see in these cigarette butts, the chemicals from the tobacco are there then lacing those microfibers that then go into the environment. Uh, nurdles is a funny word for a not funny thing in the environment. Um, nurdles is the, the pre-production pellets. So the, the little things that you see here that are uh, melted down into bottles and bags and these sorts of things. But um, to get to those production facilities, they're shipped around and they spill in astonishing numbers into the environment. They spill out of uh, rail cars, out of cargo ships. Some of these things have had like a ship in a storm will dip and flip over a, a cargo container of, of nurdles that will then uh, flush out into the ocean and float around. Think of a nurdle spill, like essentially it's an oil spill in a different form, right? That these plastics are made from fossil fuels. Um, only these can travel much, much farther than a proper oil spill will. We are starting to get early studies on um, not just where plastics are in the environment, that's, that's pretty well done, but the consequences this has for ecosystems. Uh, this is uh, a study that came out a little while ago in 2022. They looked at birds and it identified a new disease among birds, which is called plasticosis, uh, just from eating these larger pieces of or macroplastics that then get stuck in their, their guts. Uh, you can see in the picture here underneath the bird itself, those are the bigger bits. Uh, but they're also sorting through the organs and finding microplastics embedded in those essential organs, like the kidney and spleen. Um, so this is typically thought of as like, okay, well, human beings, we're hearing much more, uh, our bodies are contaminated with, with microplastics and nanoplastics, um, but there is no reason to believe that all, that not all these creatures in the environment 
are in some way contaminated with microplastics and nanoplastics. It is so pervasive that nothing on this planet is going to be left untouched. Uh, so, and speaking of this pervasiveness, uh, one of these surveys, when sur scientists go out, they pull up jugs of, it's not jugs, it's a, the proper scientific instrument, but uh, samples of, of water. Uh, one found 8,300 particles per liter of seawater. Uh, and it's important to, to remember that when you hear figures like this, these are all almost certainly underestimates of what was actually in that liter of water. 8,300 sounds like a lot, but these scientists are only able to count down to a certain size. So in order to look at the nanoplastics, you have to have very expensive, very delicate machinery that can find those. So this is 8,300 particles per liter seawater down to a certain size. And what scientists are finding in the environment is that the smaller these particles get down to the nanoscale, the more numerous they get. So it's, it's a likely a much, much higher figure than 8,300. Uh, so we're also sorting through sediments uh, in the ocean off the coast of California here. We can see some samples. Uh, what's nice about sediments is that it's deposited layer upon layer uh, year after year. So scientists can actually go back and find, in this study in particular, back to the 1940s, how much plastics has been deposited year after year. And here you can see some samples. Um, microfibers are those, those long ones that you can see more toward left. Uh, these chunks of plastic more at right. There's just a galaxy of different sizes and shapes of plastics themselves made out of different kinds of polymers. Um, so like PVC, for instance, polyester, these are all different varieties of plastics with their own varieties of chemicals involved. Scientists are identifying now a brand new habitat on planet Earth known as the plastosphere. So these Little bits of microplastics may seem small, um, but they can, again, get up to five millimeters wide. That is a lot of room for communities of microorganisms to grow. You can see here, uh, scanning electron microscope images of these organisms. Um, at right, bottom right, the little spheres, those are probably bacteria that you might be able to notice are indenting into the plastic. Uh, these scientists were speculating that these might be bacteria that are able to break down that plastic somehow without poisoning themselves to death, obviously, at least not immediately. Uh, and to the left of that, what looks like a lollipop, um, there's an inset image. Those are bacteria growing on top of another organism. So this is an extremely complex community that is brand new to planet Earth. It is a community of microorganisms growing on microplastics. This community, of course, transforms as a piece of microplastic moves around different parts of the, the ocean in particular. It might sink 2,000, 3,000 feet, and some of those microorganisms will die, others will grow. Um, and then once these things pop back up to the surface, they get whipped up into sea spray and then blow onto land. So when you're at the beach and you're, you're breathing in the fresh beach air, um, some of that actually has microplastics that have been floating around accumulating these, these microorganisms. Um, they're also searching through wastewater because we are, again, flushing these microfibers into that wastewater that then goes to wastewater treatment facility, which uh, is just a bunch of human waste involved in that as well. Um, they're finding on these microplastics uh, pathogens for humans, um, including disease, uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So that is probably not excellent news, just given how well microplastics and nanoplastics can move around the environment. Okay, so speaking of wastewater treatment, the good news is that a wastewater treatment facility like this gathers up our wastewater that is human waste and what's coming out of our washing machines. And just by luck, just from the machinery existing as it has for decades, it's able to capture 90% of microfibers from laundry water, um, which seems good until you consider what happens to that, uh, those microfibers. Uh, this is gathered up into a material called sludge. This is human waste that is treated and then put onto fields as fertilizers. We've been doing this for millennia. As long as humans have been doing agriculture, we've been applying human waste to fields as fertilizer. This is just a much larger industrial scale. Um, we are talking um, hundreds of millions of pounds of microplastics being spread in North America onto fields by way of sludge. Uh, that is, of course, getting into our crops. There's research showing that these microplastics are getting through the plant's root system and into the tissues that we eat. Um, 
So we're also considering here that when these fields dry out, when the season is over and people stop watering, winds come along and whip up that dirt and kick up not only the dust, like we saw in the, the Dust Bowl back in the 1930s, but now contained in that dust is a significant amount of microplastic that then takes to the atmosphere. Which is why scientists are finding just an extraordinary amount of microplastics falling out of the sky. This is a picture of an instrument that I was lucky enough to go see in a remote mountaintop in Utah. A scientist took me to the top of this mountain. It was a very long, arduous hike, and I do not like hiking. Um, so I don't know if you can tell from this picture, but I was exhausted and cranky. Anyway, uh, this is able to connect or uh, collect the microplastics falling out of the sky, two buckets, one for when it's raining, one for when it's dry out. Um, and they're finding that the equivalent of billions of plastic bottles are falling on the United States as microplastics each year. Um, that is just the United States. Uh, and then we're considering nanoplastics because again, they're so much smaller and so much more numerous uh, wherever they are in the environment. Uh, billions of nanoplastics deposited per square foot of snow every week in the remote Alps, far away from any human uh, civilization. So now we're thinking about a, a microplastic cycle. Uh, from this, this graphic, it was done by scientists. It's not particularly good looking. That's not their fault. They're not artists. Um, I think the waves are actually breaking the wrong direction. <laughs> the first time I met that, that's not important. Uh, so when we talk about the sea spray that I was mentioning earlier, that's probably responsible for about 11% of microplastics sent into the atmosphere, at least in the Western United States. Uh, you'll also see here soil emissions that we talked about, 5%. Um, breaking and road emissions, 84% of the microplastics going into the atmosphere, which is, which is pretty fascinating. And it's really not... Uh, an issue of urban centers, uh, strangely enough. So this modeling found that within an urban center, you have cars traveling much more slowly, even though they're producing a lot of microplastic, not just from the tires, but from the people walking around and shedding microfibers from their clothes. Uh, when you get out into these higher speed areas, so it's the speed limit is 65 miles per hour just outside of the city, that provides much more of the energy to fling these microplastics into the atmosphere. That's why they have this cute little car just outside the city. Um, that's responsible for about 84%, at least according to this modeling, of the microplastics in the Western US atmosphere. Unfortunately, the air is actually much more polluted indoors. So a lot of these studies are actually coming to pretty good agreement that air indoors tends to be about six times higher in microplastics than air outdoors. And if you think about what's surrounding us, that probably shouldn't come as much a surprise. So the clothing that we're wearing, uh, by one estimate, we shed a billion microfibers per person just by walking around uh, per year. That is accumulating on floors. You kick up those microplastics that come right back into the air. We are surrounded by carpet, uh, upholstery, the plastic products in our kitchen. When you open them, they're flinging microplastics all over the place. Um, and according to, to one estimate, we're inhaling 7,000 microplastics a day. Again, that is down to a certain size. That is not including nanoplastics, which are the ones that we actually really need to worry more about. They can get into more cells in the body and can most likely pass the blood brain barrier and get into our brains. Uh, and of course, recent studies have been showing that uh, we are finding this not only in the brain, but every other organ that scientists are sampling. Lungs, gut, liver, placenta, um, feces, blood, breast, mouth, you name it, that's where microplastics and nanoplastics are, uh, which is scary to think about, especially because the human health studies are not yet here, at least the, the really extensive ones. We know that it is in the human body, but we don't yet know how much microplastic or nanoplastic is going to be too much to have in the human body. When do we need to start worrying? The, the early reports are, are pointing to some worrying linkages to um, you know, people, actually this is back in the early 2000s, late 90s, early studies on people who work in synthetic textile factories had much higher rates of cancers of the uh, respiratory system and digestive systems. Um, and then we're also seeing some links to cardiovascular disease in more recent studies with people with higher amounts of microplastics in their, in their blood. Um, and then we have to consider 
all the 13,000 different chemicals that have been used in plastics that are leaching out of them when they're in our bodies. Um, one study found that just one kind of plasticizer chemical called phthalates, you've probably heard of these, um, the exposure may lead to 100,000 premature deaths in the US each year. And that's a conservative estimate. That is one plasticizer chemical among 13,000. You will see much more of these studies coming out in the coming years, I can promise you. Finding that it's not just the, you know, particle that's in our lungs that's probably scraping up the tissue. It's what's coming out of that particle of plastic that we really need to be concerned about. Uh, the young are going to be particularly at risk here. We have toddlers uh, roaming around the floor where these microplastics are gathering in very high numbers. Uh, so it's, it's very important that if you do have a toddler that you are vacuuming as, as best you can. Um, and when, when we're thinking about the way that, that these youngsters are feeding, infants that are drinking from a, a bottle, that form that was probably prepared with high heat and that is what breaks down the plastic of that bottle. And a study found that uh, infants may be drinking millions of microplastics, nanoplastics a day, if their formula is prepared in this way. The study actually looked at a, a very close-up shot of the, the plastic of the bottle itself and found um, essentially like, uh, like uh, chunking away of the, the plastic. It looked like the Grand Canyon, the layers of the plastic um, that had broken off enter the formula and then presumably would be entering the body of the infant. Uh, we have to be really concerned about uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals here, EDCs. When a, a young person is developing, there's an extremely precarious time where you don't want these sorts of chemicals that are messing with hormones to interfere. Um, and because we are finding microplastics and nanoplastics in placentas, um, we're assuming that these children are are born with microplastics, nanoplastics in their system, especially because uh, when scientists go through uh, the first feces of these infants, uh, they're finding microplastics and nanoplastics there as well. Okay, some, uh, some graphs here to, to talk about some, some trends. Uh, the black dotted line that goes dotted after the mid 2010s, uh, that is primary waste generation generated, that's plastic. You can see this exponential rise in the coming decades. Um, and that very sad blue line at bottom is the waste that has been recycled. It is a fraction. Um, a recent report found that we are in the United States recycling 5% of the plastic waste that we generate. Um, recycling in its current form um, is a scam. It always has been. It was invented by the plastics industry to convince us as consumers that we're the problem that uh, if only we just recycled more, we could make this problem go away. The problem is always that they were producing too much plastic, um, but it, it deflects the responsibility onto us as consumers. That's not to say that recycling cannot work. Germany actually does very well because they pump a lot of public money into that. Um, and we rely in the United States on this as a for-profit system. And unfortunately, this is not very profitable. Uh, a graph to layer on top of this that study that I mentioned about the sediments off the coast of Southern California, this is showing the deposition rate of microplastics over time, um, going back to 1940, uh, or yeah, late 1940s, uh, when plastics production really started ramping up. So it was after World War II, where we really started producing much more plastic. Uh, this maps perfectly. The more plastic we produce, that's the dotted line here, um, the more plastic we find in sediments. Uh, there was another recent study that, that was finding that back during the, um, the financial crisis, uh, they actually found a, a pretty big drop in the amount of plastics in the environment um, because the production of plastic had dropped, which is a very clear signal that if we stop producing so much plastic, and especially if we stop the industry from producing exponentially more of it um, by 2050, the the think or the, the estimate is that it will increase by three three times um, the production of plastic by 2050. We are already at a trillion pounds a year, the three trillion pounds of plastic, um, a fraction of which is getting recycled. Uh, much of it is escaping into the environment. Uh, think of any macroplastic, like a bottle or bag you see floating around out there, as pre-microplastic. It'll break down into smaller and smaller pieces. It never disappears. It just deconstructs. 
Yet one more graph here, which I think is interesting to layer on. Once again, um, this red line is classic production. Again, you see that extraordinary rise. Um, the dotted line is the marine sediment accumulation replicated here in this new graph that we just talked about. Uh, but this study looked at something else, which was the they went through museum specimens. It's actually a really fascinating study. They got permission to go through museum specimens of freshwater fishes up in the Great Lakes and dissected them and searched for the amount of plastics over time and found that, again, this is mapping very well. The more plastic we produce, the more contaminated the sediments get and the more contaminated species get. The signal is very, very clear here, um, which is all heavy. I said I was going to make it heavy. Um, so maybe I could lighten it up a little bit here by talking about solutions, including one of my favorite most fun solutions of all time. Um, Mr. Trash Wheel, <laughs> that's the, it's an actual name. That's the big barge looking thing with eyes on it. Um, that is in Baltimore Harbor. That collects mic microplastics, bottles and bags that are floating. It sucks it up into the barge. That's taken away for disposal. That's keeping those plastics from reaching the environment and eventually breaking down into microplastics and nanoplastics. Uh, above that is a microplastic filter that I got for my washing machine. Um, I did not install it because I had no idea what I'm doing. Shout out to my dad who installed it. Otherwise, I probably would have flooded the garage. Um, this collects, it has a special filter in it. It collects the microfibers coming out of your washing machine. Um, you take that filter and you send it back to the company. They're turning it into home insulation. The idea being that you're trapping those microfibers on a more permanent basis. Um, this is still not a perfect solution in that I don't think that it should be on us as consumers to invest in these things, which can be pretty expensive. Um, they get down to like $50, uh, which is not terrible, but nobody should be required to buy this. This should be a component of every washing machine that comes off the line. And in the meantime, governments need to be sending these to people as on an emergency basis because we cannot wait for everybody to replace their washing machine to stop flushing a million microfibers per load into the environment. Um, it's just, we just do not have the time for that. Um, to the right of that is a nice piece of greenery, is a, a, a roadside garden called a rain garden. This collects um, rainwater, and this also happens to collect a lot of the microplastics coming off of car tires. A study found that 90% uh, of the microplastics generated from roads can get caught up in these, these sorts of green spaces, uh, which is not, I mean, super ideal for the plants in there, but the idea is that you go in there, you collect them, you're keeping them from entering the sewer system and eventually washing out to a body of water. Uh, and then lastly, even before that, um, at bottom right, we have a device that's under development uh, that attaches to a car wheel. And this actually collects the microplastics as they're flying off of the wheel. Um, the idea being that one day if cars are equipped with this, uh, you go to the mechanic and they replace your air filter, but they also replace the microplastic filter on your wheels. It's pretty neat. It's, a, it's about getting as far upstream as possible um, to, to not wait until it's into a wastewater treatment facility or into a rain garden, but right at the source as best as we can. And speaking of the source, uh, any Plastic scientists will tell you that the only solution to this problem is not more recycling, uh, it's not bioplastics, it is to stop producing so much plastic in the first place. That is as far upstream as we can possibly go. Um, when you do that, you get a very clear signal in the environment, like during the financial crisis, all of a sudden, microplastic contam contamination starts dropping. If we can drop the amount of plastic production, in fact, we need to keep it from getting to three times the size it is right now by 2050, then we can really put a dent in what's entering the environment. And then hopefully over time, it can settle in sediments and then you have somewhat solved the problem. It's still gonna fly around the atmosphere, but that over time too would clear, but it would require us getting rid of plastic. So no single use wrap cucumbers, for instance, which is a madness because cucumbers have skins of their own. Um, I found this nice jar of coffee at my local shop. Why are not all coffee coffees packed in glass jars like this? Um, it's doable. It was just only ever profit seeking on the part of these companies. It was cheaper for them to produce plastic and put things in plastic and cheaper for them to ship it around because it's lighter, um, but that needs to stop. Um, we cannot let the industry get away with increasing the production of plastic like it's planned on doing while still bamboozling us into thinking recycling is going to solve the problem. 
um, when we need a massive cut in the amount of plastic. And I think it it can it can happen. I'm actually very hopeful of the plastics treaty that's currently under negotiation um, at the UN. Uh, we'll see uh, probably finalization of that toward the end of the year. Um, the U.S. has been stonewalling a bit, obviously, because we have so much plastic production here, but they have recently signaled that they're actually going to get more ambitious. Um, the gold standard, what all these plastics groups and plastic scientists, anti-plastics groups, I should say, and plastic scientists are after is a mandatory cap on production internationally. You can't do it country by country because if one country bans production, it just picks up and goes to a different country. Um, that is our best hope, that treaty. I'm actually fairly, uh, this is a not a very hopeful presentation, I apologize for that, but I wanna leave you with that is that um, we have a lot of very smart people in those rooms pushing back against governments who don't wanna be ambitious. Uh, and I'm quite hopeful that something will actually come of that. And that's it for me. Um, and I love questions and I, we left a good amount of time for questions, excellent. Um, and I'm, I'm more than happy to take those. Great, thank you so much for a fabulous presentation, Matt. And I'll get to the questions here. And so our first question comes from Anonymous. Uh, is sludge still being used today? I was reading that medication that are used by people is still being found in the sludge and contaminating crops or other things in the soil being used. It is still very much being used today, yes. Um, it is treated to a, a certain standard um, to try to remove as many pathogens as they can. But uh, yes, as you rightly point out, this has been getting a lot of uh, media coverage lately. Uh, attention has been focusing on the chemicals that we're, we're adding to that sludge just from our wastewater. So obviously the, the, the prescription drugs that come through our bodies, but they're finding lots of forever chemicals in addition to those um, that are then being applied to fields. Those of course get taken up into crops and then get into our bodies that way. Um, I'd, I'd love to actually see somebody work out the contribution of forever chemicals from other sources in the home that were flushing down the drain like cleaners and things like that um, versus what's actually leaching out of the microplastics that is going into wastewater. Um, but yes, there's, uh, sludge is getting much more attention lately. Um, but the tricky thing is, is that it, producing lots of fertilizer comes, of course, with its own uh, environmental cost, just the way that it's done now. Um, so yeah, we need a lot more compost. I'm a big fan of biochar. Let's charge a bunch of biochar with nutrients from compost and put that on the fields instead. But human waste sludge is um, obviously very cheap because <laughs> nobody wants it other than these farms. Um, so you'll see that battle, I think, play out uh, in the coming years as more attention is put onto the chemicals involved. So Rowan asks, is there a projected future involving microplastic inhabiting bacteria? What problems could this create on a mass scale? I, is, uh, to, so that I, I take it to mean that bacteria are hitching a ride on, on microplastics. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so as I mentioned, they were finding these, they were going through wastewater, picking up the microplastics and finding these pathogens for humans on there. Um, I think a really important consideration here is that it wasn't until quite recently that microplastic scientists fully understood just how far microplastics can travel. So um, we are talking on the order of weeks up in the atmosphere, especially the very small stuff. Um, so we need much more research into, as those microplastics that are up there, are they transporting antibiotic resistant bacteria to places where they shouldn't be. I talked to a couple of researchers in the book who are who are thinking that, is this allowing these pathogens not only to get to populations of humans, but are microplastics starting in one environment, picking up a, a bacteria that has never been in an environment all the way around the world and then transferring it over there um, when it would never have gotten there to begin with. Uh, another important consideration here beyond those those bacteria is scientists are looking into also as the particles out there in the atmosphere, are they influencing the climate in some way? The early research is showing that they might actually be warming the atmosphere just a tiny bit, you know, especially the dark colored particles that absorb more of the sun's energy. Um, but are they also acting as nuclei for cloud condensation? So clouds form when moisture gloms onto pieces of dust and viruses and things like that in the atmosphere. Are microplastics brightening clouds, which would actually help the climate in some ways um, by bouncing uh, some of that energy back into space? 
But we also need to consider uh, you know, the slide that I showed earlier about the, the emissions involved in the production of plastic. Um, this is, um, it's, it's the amount of carbon coming from this industry is on the order of a, a large country currently, and it's only going to get bigger from here. Um, so it's about, let's find out more about those microbes. Should we be worried about that for sure? Is it transporting it into places they shouldn't be? But also let's consider, well, what are those particles also doing while they're up in the atmosphere? Uh, Colleen has a couple of related questions. So I'm just gonna kind of come, I'm gonna put both of them together here. So the first one is, I've heard within the past few years that much of the plastics we recycle never ends up going to a recycling plant and just goes to landfill with everything else. How accurate is that statement? And then following up on that, does using recycled plastic to manufacture new plastic products actually help fix the problem or have as much of an impact as we are led to believe? And you kind of answered that earlier, I think. Yeah, I can elaborate on those great questions. Um, so yes, a, a very tiny fraction, at least in the United, United States, of plastic is actually recycled. Um, honestly, we would be lucky if it were just landfilled instead of recycled. Um, but unfortunately, the United States has been sneaky. We've been doing this for decades now, uh, pretending like we're recycling. We ship an astonishing amount of our waste plastic that we cannot profitably recycle to developing countries. Um, until recently, this was China, largely. A couple of years ago, they said no more to that and ban the practice. So now the U.S. and other developed countries are sending our waste plastic that we can't recycle to other countries, thinking that they'll recycle it because they have cheaper labor. It's still not being recycled. So it is being, uh, where possible, landfilled. Um, but if not, if it's a small island nation like in Indonesia or somewhere, uh, they don't have the room to be doing that. Oftentimes it is being burned. Um, that is, of course, um, just indescribably bad for human health. Um, just the, the amount of chemicals that we're talking about here. So we're poisoning, by using so much plastic, we are indirectly poisoning these communities, not by any fault of our own. Um, but of course, that is an object of contention in this plastics treaty. It's like these countries are saying, we are drowning in the plastic from the developed world. Um, please stop this. And the way to do that, again, stop producing so much plastic. Um, but unfortunately, the the uh, the way to do it is not recycling, getting to your, your, second, your second question here. So um, there is a good amount of evidence showing that recycled products are actually more toxic. So the more you recycle a piece of plastic, the more toxic it gets. Um, you can actually only recycle a, a given piece of plastic a couple of times before it degrades to a point where you can't recycle it anymore. And then you just got to chuck it in the bin. Um, so plastics are not infinitely recyclable. Um, so we'll start hearing about new ways of recycling. So like chemical recycling, that's a farce. It doesn't work. It's still toxic. Um, these are ways for the industry to keep saying that it's doing something um, when in fact it's producing exponentially more plastic, um, but it, not helping at all. Uh, you also hear about, I think I mentioned it in the presentation and never returned to it, which is my fault. Um, I said that bioplastics are, are not a solution. Bioplastics made from uh, plant material like corn, uh, that carbon is just coming from corn stock instead of from fossil fuels. It's the same plastic. You are just replacing the source of carbon. It's all the other chemicals that make plastic a plastic, uh, that 13,000 other chemicals, many of which we know to be highly toxic. Um, you then run into problems. Well, okay, we're going to replace the astronomical amount of plastic that we're making on this planet with everything made from corn. We are going to need a tremendous amount of land. And researchers actually worked this out. In Europe, they found that it, like replacing just the plastics in Europe, used in Europe, you would need uh, a land area the size of France and water equal to what the EU uses in an entire year, uh, which is obviously not sustainable. Uh, so do not be fooled into thinking that bioplastics are also um, biodegradable. Those are two separate classes, but also biodegradable often just means that it breaks down into microplastics faster, um, which I guess is okay. Okay, if you don't want something choking on a, a plastic bag or bottle, um, but it's not solving the problem. It's it's greenwashing, and I I feel like we've let the industry get away with that for for too long. Um, we just need much more 
uh, I guess, transparency on that. And we just need more awareness that the solution here is not different kinds of plastics. It's just less plastic. We have plenty of other materials that work just as fine until, you know, 50 years ago when, when plastics production was really getting going. Uh, we can do perfectly fine without them. Anonymous has a couple of questions too. Would replacing plastic with glass, where possible, be more sustainable? Yeah, I mentioned that in the presentation. I absolutely think so. So glass is very easily recyclable. The reason, again, that the industry switched away from this was that plastic is cheaper. It's extremely cheap to make, um, which is why the industry produces so much of it in general, uh, but it's also lighter. So it allows them to increase their profit margins. Um, it's just, it's easier to ship the stuff that's that's lighter. Uh, we need to get away from this mentality of, of single use, especially for plastic bottles for water and things like that. Um, these things could very easily be in glass, which is not just very easily recyclable, but just reusable. Um, you and your home can reuse a glass bottle um, for the rest of your life unless you drop it. Uh, so yes, I, I fully support um, more glass, cardboard, New newfangled materials. So people are, are experimenting with making uh, better packing materials out of like mushrooms and things like that. Uh, we'll see more of those in the coming years. We just need to be very, very careful um, that we are not producing material that is equally as toxic as plastic um, uh, because we don't want that either. And, um, actually, something I was going to mention when talking about recycling is that um, there's this notion that we don't even want plastics cycling through in a sort of circular economy anyway. That's not the goal that we should have because we are getting more and more evidence that uh, we are poisoning ourselves with the different chemicals that are, are specific to plastics packaging. So uh, we don't want this circulating forever and keep recycling it because any food that it's in contact with, it is leaching chemicals and it is pulling out microplastics that then go into our bodies. Glass doesn't do that. Um, so I think as more awareness, public awareness comes around to the health effects of plastics will get more movement away from the material, hopefully, and to these legacy materials that work perfectly fine until somebody in a corporate office decided to increase their profit margins with plastic. I'm going to have to do some jumping around here for questions as we've got, I've got to tell you, Matt, you've got the record. I've never seen so oh. many questions during a One Health presentation before. Good. Great job. I'll Flavor just say I'll right, I'm I'm say right now that if you don't get to them, then I can, I'll happily answer any questions by email if anybody wants to follow up if we don't get them. Great, great. Uh, Claire asks, is there any legislation in, in process or being proposed in the U.S. to cap plastics? No. Um, no, that's going to be tough because we have the state system here, obviously. So like one state can go and ban plastics production. Again, it's just gonna to move to a different state. We don't have anything on the national agenda to be doing this. Um, there's just not an awareness of plastic as a problem that is so intricately connected to climate change. I think if it, if it were more clearly connected, politicians would actually see that this is not just a problem of us poisoning ourselves with this material, but we're exacerbating climate change at the same time. What we are seeing is, is movement on a more uh, local scale. So California has been doing actually some interesting things in recent years, um, kind of solidifying a framework around microplastics. So they, they define microplastics um, extensively in, in recent years, which allows them to then start saying, okay, well, how can we regulate it if we have this definition? Um, how can we say you are not allowed to have a washing machine that spits out X number of microplastics, um, except Gavin Newsom, our gov governor here, just vetoed a bill um, that would require some uh, filters on washing machines, which is extremely disappointing. Um, so you'll see, I think, in places like California, developing more of a framework uh, that will spread to other states that will get more visibility around plastics as not just a macroplastic problem, but a microplastic problem. Um, but unfortunately, like so many other things in the United States, it's going to be patchwork. Um, it's going to be up to states to do their own thing. Um, I, I just don't really see a, a movement in Congress for these these people to, you know, sit down with the fossil fuel industry and, and to, it's the same industry, but fossil fuels and plastics, the same industry. Um, sit down with them and say, hey, you can't produce uh, some of the stuff that makes you lots of money. I'm sorry uh, to do that. Um, maybe one day, but this is what the international treaty is for, right? So you 
you put a mandatory international cap on production. Um, so we get more ambition in, in countries that'll say, okay, well, that's not enough for us. We're going to slash plastics production by 90%. And if you don't like it, well, then that's too bad. You can leave. Um, hopefully move it there as well. Yeah, I don't know if you're aware of this, Matt, but the Attorney General of, of New York State has brought a suit against uh, Pepsi uh, for pollution in the Buffalo River. Uh, so that ought to be interesting as to how that comes out as well. Yeah, it's great. It's, I mean, it's a, a part of this movement of extended producer responsibility, uh, like reframing this as you have, as a company have created this thing, you're not somehow not responsible for it once it hits shelves and somebody consumes it. Um, you need to take responsibility for this sort of pollution. Because um, again, it's, it's a, this is an age old industry tactic is, is shifting the blame to us as consumers when we never asked for all this plastic. Nobody I know asked for all this plastic. Um, and I don't imagine anybody you know did either. Uh, so this is a interesting, well, a good question from Anonymous. Uh, do we know how microplastics are affecting our pets? That's a good question. I, I had not heard anything. Um, I was writing the book a couple of years ago when the, the uh, research was still pretty new. They were looking more into the environment and uh, starting to do some human health studies, but I would imagine that the numbers are going to be very high. So when we're talking about the indoor space, all of these microfibers uh, falling off our clothing, couches, things like that, carpet, um, selling on the floor, pets are lying down the floor a lot as our toddlers crawling around, and they're the ones that are in, in kind of the direct contact with those microfibers, which is again why I say you should be vacuuming re religiously, but also take care to dispose of that dust in the right way. You don't want to like bang it out into the trash can and have it take to the air anyway. Anyway, no, I'd, I'd love to, to see some studies about uh, uh, in in um, in pets, but I will say actually there was a there was one study that looked at uh, like fish farms. So fish are made fish farms use fish food that is made out of ground up fish, um, and these researchers went through and found really high levels of of microplastics in that fish food, um, which then go into the fish which then absorb the microplastics. And it's just like the cycle of additional microplastic contamination. Um, those aren't pets, but close. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Anne asks a good question too. Lots of plastics are used in medicine and medical procedures. Are there any viable alternatives? This is another tough one. So yes, the, I mean, I make it pretty clear in the book that I, I don't say that we can feasibly get rid of plastics altogether. So like uh, an airplane can't fly um, unless it had all that plastic uh, that makes it much lighter. It's just, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to get off the ground, um, at least the size of the airplanes that we fly today. Um, in medical uses, this is extremely difficult because plastic, I mean, we have such high health care in the United States as it is, plastic helps bring those down even a little bit. Like if, it's, if they're using these disposable, very cheap plastic IV bags, that sort of thing. Um, there's, there's, some research looking into, well, shoot, if we're putting this liquid into people's veins that has been sitting in a plastic bag, are we injecting them with stuff that sustains their life? But also is that absorbing some chemicals from the plastics that could actually be bad for them? Um, then also consider that we have medical devices in our, our bodies. Um, those have been shown to shed pieces of plastics that then migrate around tissues. Um, but yeah, where, where do we draw the line here, right? Like, do we want to save lives with these sorts of things? Um, but also, can we force the industry to work toward new materials that we can confirm to be non-toxic and move away from plastic altogether? Well, we're pretty close to the end of our time. And I, I wanted to ask a question, uh, Matt. So Matt, you've been writing several books. I noticed that your other books are also uh, oriented towards the environment or towards the animals and insects. Uh, you're working now for, for Grist Magazine on environmental issues. Do you have any advice for anyone who, well, for any of our students who may be interested in taking the knowledge that they gain about particular subjects 
uh, and maybe becoming writers? Yeah, I mean, I would say that if you have an opportunity to write for a, a college paper, that's that's how I started. Um, I think I started in high school at my high school paper. That doesn't really count. We weren't really doing proper journalism there. <laughs> uh, but if you can get on the, on a high school team, that helps. Um, I will also say that fellowships are really powerful in this industry. It's a really great way to get into it. So Grist runs a a fellowship program where folks come on for I believe six months um, and we basically mentor them like we have fellows that I, I work with on stories um, to show them the ropes um, there's there's really a, there's journalism school is very good um, but there's certain things that you have to learn um, uh, the hard way like learning the hard way but with a fellowship program I can teach you things that I learned the hard way that, that you don't necessarily need to go through that pain <laughs> either. Um, so do keep a look at a lot of different outlets still do those programs. They're paid um, a lot of the time, at least hopefully they're paid. Um, that is a great way to get a foot in the door. Um, and then uh, you'd be surprised, well, maybe not surprised that in journalism, people move around a lot. You'll meet somebody who's working at one place. They'll move to another publication. They'll somehow have an opening for uh, an environmental writer, uh, and then that's a good way for you to get uh, your foot in the door there as well. And for our students at DelVal, uh, just a reminder that DelVal does have a minor in One Health Communications, uh, and I would certainly encourage any of you that are interested in writing uh, to think, call, think about that and uh, take every opportunity to, to write and learn more about how you can Spread the word. And Matt, you have done a fabulous job with this. You know, I, I grew up in a time when the mantra was better living through chemistry. Uh, and we're now seeing that we're looking at a new era, many people calling it the Anthropocene. Um, and all of those decisions that were made 50, 70 years ago are now coming back and, and biting us. Um, we need to pay much more attention to what we're doing to ourselves, to the environment, and to every other living creature on the planet. I thank you for what you do. And again, I encourage everybody, please do uh, go to Island Press, buy Matt's book, uh, incredible resource. You have done a fabulous job with, with researching this topic, and I, I thank you for that. And I thank all of you for joining us this evening as well. Have a great evening.